Hey, g'day, it's Prezzo. Thanks for joining me in the workshop today. Now, this sticker arrived in the mail this week. It came all the way from Austin, Texas in the USA, and it belongs to Joe Pysinski or Joe Pye. Now, if you haven't seen his channel yet, you are seriously missing out. Now, it's an absolute treasure trove of useful information about metal machining. So that's lathe work, milling machine work, layout, setups, trigonometry, geometry, you name it, it's all there. And I love that on his sticker it says, Joe Pye taught me something. Now that's absolutely true in my case. Uh, having watched Joe now for the last uh, four or five years, uh, I've learned so much about better ways of doing things around my workshop. And uh, I can attest to the fact that I now know how to use my indicator properly for centering work on the milling machine. I know how to use springs and uh, coil springs, leaf springs to help with setups in the milling machine vise. So uh, yeah, it's, it's well worth checking out. And the t-shirt I'm wearing today, I sort of made this, uh, I think it was last year. And if you're wondering what the acronym means, it's uh, what would Joe Pysinski do? And that's a question I ask myself all the time when I'm working on the milling machine and the lathe. Uh, if I'm about to do something which is uh, stupid or uh, going to lead to inaccuracy, I'll stop and think and I'll try and think back to what Joe would have done in the same situation. So yeah, check it out. It's, it's, I can highly recommend it. <laughs> now, today we're back on the Art Deco wall lights or wall sconces and we're going to do the electroplating on some parts today. But first, I want to start with a rant, so stand by. Okay, rant starts now. <laughs> now, this is a toilet roll holder or a towel holder. In our house, we have two bathrooms, and between those two rooms, we have five of these things. Now, these weren't cheap. They were purchased from a reputable company, and the assumption was that when you buy something like this and you pay that amount of money, you're going to get something that will last for at least 20 years. Now it turns out that these are around about eight years old and after about five years they began to corrode through this electroplating on the surface here. And you can see quite clearly that's rust coming through there. So this part is made of steel and this part here is made of a cheap die cast alloy. Now they look great when you buy them and uh, you know, you're assuming you're paying that much money you're going to get something which is made of brass. Now brass is a, a very, very good metal for doing this sort of work in. It's uh, corrosion resistant and when it's electroplated, even with a thin coating of electroplate, it should last for 20 to 30 years and it will look good. Now even this cheap die cast alloy that this part is made from is beginning to corrode through. So you can see some little speckles appearing there. So it won't be that long before this part is going to be damaged beyond repair as well, or at least it's not going to look any good. So what do you do? Well, one of the things about being able to electroplate at home is that you can remanufacture parts like this and plate them, but make them out of something which is more suitable. So in my view, brass is the ideal material for making these parts from, and that's what I thought I was buying when I got these. So in this uh, first part of the video, I'm going to show you this part that I've remanufactured in brass rod, and we're going to electroplate that in nickel cobalt, which is a very, very close match for whatever this is. Now, I know why manufacturers do this. It's because steel is cheap, it's easy to bend, and also the electroplating that's on this is probably not chromium. It's probably nickel cobalt, which is what I'm going to be using. The reason I don't use chromium these days is because it's a toxic metal. It's not very environmentally friendly to get rid of the waste. So they, they cheap out and they say, we'll use a cheap, thin coat of electroplate over a very, very unsuitable material. And this is what you end up with. So yes, it's disappointing. And I'm going to show you an ad here that I found on the internet. And this is for a similar product from the same manufacturer. These are probably uh, unavailable now. But you'll notice when you zoom in there, it says that the material that this is made from is just metal. <laughs> which is accurate, yes, it's all metal, but it's unsuitable metal. And it just simply describes the color as chrome, which again is accurate, but probably not what you think that you're buying when you get these. End of rant. This is the part that we're gonna be plating today. So this is 3 eighths of an inch brass rod. It's uh, roughly 300 millimeters long. At least I just bought 300 millimeter long piece of stock and bent the shape out of that. 
Now I needed some machining up here. This takes two O-rings and that helps to keep that part from rattling inside the, the, the fitting that screws to the wall. This end of the hook here had to have a sort of a semi-dome shape machined on it, which I did in the lathe. Now here's the original and you can see those O-rings there. And would you believe it, but that steel is 8.8 millimeters diameter. Now why? <laughs> this is uh, 3 eighths of an inch, so it's uh, 9.525 millimeters. And that's why there's a bit of a step there in the end there. This is machined to the same diameter as the steel part, but I left the rest of it at its uh, normal diameter of 3 eighths of an inch. So what we're going to do now is clean this. Now I'm using this product here, uh, Simple Green. Buy this concentrate. I've actually mixed this uh, a lot stronger than it would normally be mixed and that helps to cut through the grease from the polishing that I used on the, the buffing mop. So there's a little bit of that uh, waxy grease stuff still there. All of that's got to come off and we're going to do a water break test to make sure it's chemically clean before it goes into the plating bath. So I'm just going to scrub this now just using a toothbrush. You just sort of go along Keep scrubbing it, keep rinsing it until you can see that the water is no longer breaking on the surface there. So the water should cling on the part and that tells you that it's clean. Now I knew you'd be judging the cleanliness of my sink so I had to stop and <laughs> give it a scrub. Uh, the reality is that my workshop cleaner has uh, got COVID and has had to take the month off. So yeah, things aren't the spick and span as they normally are around here. Anyway, this is what we're doing. We're just going to scrub and scrub and scrub. This is uh, usually a five to ten minute job and you want to be very, very thorough. I'll just do this a bit and I'll rinse it and I'll show you what, uh, what it looks like when it's not ready. All right, that's been about what, two or three minutes. And you can see right on the very end there how that water is beating up. So that's an indication that you need to do more work on it. But uh, like I say, it's, it's just a repetitive process. You just got to keep at it. Down here, it's not too bad. The water is still clinging onto that surface there. And around this detail area here, it's going to take a bit of work because you get a buildup of polishing wax in those little uh, nooks and crannies there. Here's a brief overview of the electroplating system we're using today. This one here is for nickel cobalt. I've got another one of these setups for just straight nickel and another one for zinc. Now the reason I'm using nickel cobalt is that it's very very close in colour to chrome plating but it's a lot safer, it's a lot cheaper, it's just more accessible for a home workshop situation. The nickel plating system that I use is just for the different colour. Nickel is a slightly warmer colour than nickel cobalt and it's ideal for doing things like antique motorcycle parts or antique machinery parts. Now the zinc system that I use just for corrosion resistance on fasteners and metal parts that you're likely to use on tools and machinery. Now all of these systems are very similar. There's a five litre plastic tub. Inside is four litres of an electrolyte. You buy the electrolyte as a crystal or a powder. You mix it up with this distilled water and all of the products that I buy for home plating uh, in, in my workshop come from this company. So it's called Jane Plating Kits. They're based here in Australia. They're not a sponsor. I pay retail price for everything I buy. But the reason I like them is that they've got good backup. Uh, if you have a problem, you can ring them up and get advice. And I don't have to pay overseas shipping rates for anything that I buy. Now they do a wide range of not only plating kits, but also metal finishing kits as well. I own uh, one of their Parker Phosphate systems and I also bought the blue and gold passivating for the zinc plate that I do. So they do, uh, as well as the, the ones that I mentioned, they also do gold plating, they do copper plating, electroless nickel, which is a process for plating where you don't have to use an electric current. So yeah, they're a good company and uh, you know, I, I can thoroughly recommend them. Now. What I've got inside the tub at the moment is a heater. Now, that's it there at the back there. It's an immersion style heater. And that's currently heating that up to about 120 degrees Fahrenheit. I'll put the Celsius up on the screen there. And I bought that little heater from uh, Caswell Australia. But I think uh, Jane Kitts sell one as well. 
Now the anodes are hanging on the side of the top. There are two sets of anodes, one on either side, and they look like this. So these are just like a mesh basket, and inside the basket are what they call the nickel R rounds. Now these are like coin-sized lumps of the, the metal that you want to plate. Now the, this one is for nickel, and it looks almost identical to the nickel R, and I've had to put a little tag on there so I don't get them mixed up. But uh, you, can, you can purchase this from um, Jane Kits, uh, but other places sell them as well. All right, now I've got a copper bus bar on top here where you hang the parts, and uh, the negative terminal of my power supply is connected to that bus bar, so your parts are always connected to negative on your DC power supply, and the uh, anodes are connected to the positive. That's that red wire there. The green wire just goes around and joins the two baskets together. Now the power supply that I'm using here is a DC power supply. This will do up to 32 volts DC at five amps. This one has uh, controls so you can set either amperage or voltage and it will hold that on the part. Now nickel plating and nickel cobalt only requires about three volts and I rarely go above two amps on uh, parts that I can fit inside that tub there. So it doesn't have a high electrical demand. You don't need a, a super duper power supply. Alrighty, so what I'm going to do is I'll get one of those uh, brass hooks that I've made for those uh, towel holders and we'll do one of those first and then we'll get stuck into the Art Deco lamp parts. Okay, with that part clean now, we can turn our power supply on and the recommendation is that you have your power running before you hang the part on the bus bar and I just bent that little uh, copper wire hook there so that we can get this fully submerged and hopefully align so it doesn't touch the the anodes in their baskets, uh, otherwise you're going to get a short circuit. So we're just going to immerse that in the electrolyte and then as soon as it touches the bus bar it starts to conduct current. The book says to leave that in that electrolyte now for around about uh, half an hour to 45 minutes. That will give you a really good thick coating of nickel cobalt on that part. The other thing is that you should never take it out of the bath to have a look at it until you're sure it's finished. If you do remove it from the bus bar and disconnect it electrically, then put it back in again, you can get two separate layers of electroplate on the surface and that can lead to delamination later. So you just got to put it in and leave it, forget about it, come back in you know, the appropriate time and check it then. You can see from the power supply here we're taking 2.4 volts DC on that part and it's uh, running at the full 2 amps that I set the power supply to. Now you can go higher with the amperage but if you overdo it, you can get a very active stream of bubbles coming off the part and that can lead to the finish being less bright than it would be if you use a lower amperage for longer. So uh, there are formulas for working out the correct current density. You need to work out the surface area of the part. Uh, in practice, I don't do that. I just sort of take a guess and it seems to work out for me. If you're doing this commercially, you'd want to be able to calculate those areas and current densities accurately just for efficiency but in my case it's it's neither here nor there so i just sort of have, have a guess and it seems to work out anyway we'll come back in say i don't know like half an hour and we'll check it then okay that's been in there for about 35 to 40 minutes so i've turned the power supply off so i'm just going to pull this out now the reason i turned the power supply off is that you don't accidentally short out the part against the uh, the anodes and uh, there it is and I never get tired of that <laughs> it's it's like alchemy I mean you put in a piece that looks like brass and you get that out so that's beautiful I'm just going to rinse that off and I'll give you a closer look okay just rinse that off under the tap there and uh, when you take it out if you notice there's any dull patches you can polish it with like a paste polish or you can buff it the nickel cobalt is quite hard it's unlikely you're going to get through that layer and into the brass underneath unless you really go for it. But uh, that's still wet, but that's how it comes out. And when I first started doing this, I was having problems. It would come out dull. And what I found was that uh, I had to filter the electrolyte. It had a lot of uh, like grit and uh, powdery stuff in it. So I bought some coffee filters and I just sort of filtered all of the electrolyte. It took a long time. But since then, I'm getting those sort of results there. So super happy with that. Here's one that I did previously, and that's fitted to the, the bracket that goes on the wall there now. So um, 
yeah, I think they look like bored ones. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna go ahead and do the, um, the light parts or the lamp parts now. And they're all essentially the same as what I've just shown you there. So I won't dwell on it. I'll just uh, dip the parts, take them out and show you. And I'll try and get uh, some of the parts assembled in this video. First of the parts I'll do for the Art Deco lamps are these castings. Now I did all of the polishing on these in the last video. And these have just been sitting in the cleaning solution, giving them a last minute scrub. And I can do two of these at a time, possibly three, but I've got four to do in total, so I'll just do them in pairs. So again, uh, plating baths heated up. I've got the power supply turned on, and we're just gonna hook these over the, the copper pipe. So you can see the voltage and the current display on the power supply chain, so I know it's made electrical contact. Going at the other one. Just want to make sure they're not touching each other or touching anything else inside the electrolyte there. Okay, same deal. I'll leave them for about 30, 40 minutes. Okay, I'll take a look at these. Nice. Also nice. <laughs> okay, I'll rinse these off now. All the rest of the parts are going to be done the same way, so I'm not going to bore you by watching every single part. What I will show you is the large rectangular frames that everything attaches to because I can't do them in this container here. I'm going to have to do uh, those in a separate uh, plastic container of some sort. So when I get to that point, I'll bring you back and we'll have a look at that. Why don't I rinse these? We'll have a closer look. Okay, well, there's the uh, nickel cobalt part on the left, and here's the brass part that's been polished and ready to go in the bath. I'll need to degrease that. But you get a sense of the change in color, and uh, these have come out really, really nice. Uh, sometimes when you take them out, you see like a black smut on it, and you can polish it off just with a clean cloth and some paste polish. So, um, yeah, it's pretty good. Anyway, let's get the rest of the parts through the bath and then, like I say, we'll come back and we'll look at those rectangular frames later on. Just got a few uh, flat parts in here and I've put an air uh, agitation device at the back there. It's just a piece of plastic tubing hooked up to my compressor and just helps to circulate the electrolyte. I find that flat parts are more susceptible to little um, bubbles propagating off the surface of the part. So we'll see how these turned out. So that one, I don't know if you can see it, but it's getting a bit dull. So I'm gonna to need to add some brightener to the mix and that prevents that happening. That'll polish off, but if you've got the correct amount of brightener in there, it'll come out super, super bright without any other work needing to be done on it. So let's have a look at this one. That one's better. But yeah, I'll add some more brightener and we'll do the other big parts. So this is the uh, nickel brightener and it says to add about five milliliters per liter of bath size. So I've got a, a four liter bath there. So it's 20 mil, but I won't add that much. Uh, when it starts to go off a bit, you just add a little bit and you know, see if it brightens up the part. Uh, if it doesn't, you can add a bit more. But if you overdo it, if you overdose it with the brightener, paradoxically, it makes the parts dull. <laughs> and here's the part that came out that did look a bit dull and I just gave that a quick polish on a, a bit of cloth with some metal polish and that's fine. So these uh, big parts with the large flat surfaces have fought me every step of the way. I'll talk more about it later but they're not the easiest thing in the world to do. Uh, curved surfaces are easy, big flat surfaces, yeah, nightmare. <laughs> I don't know if you can see that, but they're much brighter now. I've got two more of these to go, and then I can start on the rectangular frames. This is the uh, setup that I'm using for these rectangular frames. So I've just got them hanging on some heavier copper wire here. And I'm using this uh, long rectangular plastic tank, and I've had to put a longer copper bus bar across the top of that. And you can see the copper loops there holding that part in place. 
Now this is very very tight. Um, I don't have a lot of room either side and the anode baskets are hanging very close to the part but I got a you know like a flashlight or a torch and had a look down in there and made sure that everything was clear and it, it just fits and uh, if I had a dead short it would show up here on the power supply. So I've got my air line in there just agitating that solution and uh, everything's hooked up it's all running the only problem is I can't heat this electrolyte with my little immersion heater here because half of the heating element is exposed. It's out of the solution. So if I try to run that, the top half of the heating element will overheat. So I warmed this up before I decanted it into this tank here. I'll just have to hope that it's enough residual heat there to get the plating done. When I do the next one, I'll have to heat it in another container and put it back in here again. So um, I'm just going to show you the solution though and what happened when I decanted my 4 litre solution into here. What's left in this tub here is uh, the, the dregs basically and this is uh, contaminated with what looks like a very fine brass powder and some green coagulated sludge. So um, yeah I don't know where that comes from but I'm going to have to filter this before I put it back into, well filter all of it before it goes back in here and I'll clean the container. But that's surprising. Um, I thought that, you know, unless you actually tip something in there, I didn't uh, think that this would get contaminated with what looks like a powder. So um, I'll have to ask my guru what that's all about. But I know in commercial plating uh, plants they have continuous filtration running and uh, there must be a, a reason why that's necessary. Anyway, uh, we'll let this cook for about another 20 minutes, take it out, and then I've just got the one rectangular frame still to do, and then uh, we're done. Okay, I'll call time on this one, we'll just see how it looks. So power off. Okay, I think that's good. Uh, I'm just going to warm this solution up, do the second frame, and then I'll get one of these assembled and show you what it looks like, and then we'll talk about what went right, what went wrong, and plenty went wrong. You might recall that I said yesterday I was going to filter that electrolyte. Well, I did, and this is the, what I thought was like a green gunge. It's actually crystals. Now, I don't know what it is. Uh, if anybody out there has uh, any knowledge about electroplating and can tell me what that is and whether it's important or not, let me know. And uh, this is the, the rest of the sludge that came out of the coffee filter. So this is just like a brown slime. <laughs> and uh, there's some more of that crystal material in there. But again, that was totally surprising. I'd filtered all of that electrolyte before I started this project and it should have been relatively clean, but this has just appeared while I've been doing these parts. But like I said, in commercial electroplating, they filter the electrolyte continuously. So I'm guessing that this is a normal uh, part of electroplating. Anyway, it's all clean now, so I'm going to put it back and it'll be ready to go for next time. Okay, here are the parts that I completed yesterday and I've done a complete assembly of all of the parts that I've made so far. And that's it there. And when I got this together and sort of held it up at arm's length and squinted a bit, <laughs> I was totally happy with it. But how good is it really? Well, I'm going to try and demonstrate that now. Okay, this part here is probably the best out of all of the ones that I did with the electroplating anyway and the preparation of this. And I want to demonstrate how you can cheat on YouTube when you're showing something that you polished. And typically the way you do that is you get something like a pencil and you hold it up sort of parallel to that surface and you put it down there and you say, look at that, it's just like a mirror. But is it really? Well, no, it's not. Now, I'm going to point this directly at the camera. It's a bit hard with the, you know, the coating that's on there. You can see the light reflecting off that, but you can see every single scratch in that. And there's also like a speckled sort of appearance to it. And as I tried as hard as I could and I could not get rid of that. So at the end of the day, you've got to sort of recognize that you're flogging a dead horse and you've got to say, is it worth going any further? Now, given that this part is going to be held up above head height, you're probably not going to see that flat surface at all, but you will see these edges around here. Now these have come out really well, and I mentioned earlier that curved surfaces are fairly easy to do, but big flat surfaces like that are much more difficult. And it's because of the geometry of that part 
Any waviness will show up immediately in the reflected image and any surface defects will show up when you look directly at it. But these curved surfaces here tend to be a bit more forgiving. So at the end of the day, I can live with this. I'd like to learn how to do it better, but for the moment, I'm gonna put up with this as it is. Here's one of the castings that I did. And once again, you see what I mean about those curved surfaces reflecting that light beautifully. But if you look really carefully at the flat surface on the side there, there are defects in it. So again, that's just probably my inexperience with this process, but I'm still happy with it. Now here's the rectangular frame that I did yesterday. And this has turned out really well. This is the only surface that's going to be seen when the assembly is together and on the wall. And on the back here, I didn't go to any trouble at all with that. I just sort of plated it as it was. I gave it a clean, but that's all. And down in this corner here, look, down in this corner here, you'll see there's like an area that's still just plain brass. And I've realized now what happened was that there was an air bubble collecting in that corner. So when this went into the plating bath, it was like that. And this hollow area underneath the back was collecting air from the, the little air tube that I had agitating the solution. So a bubble is just collected there and it didn't disperse and that's what happens. So in hindsight, I probably should have put the part in the plating solution with this hollow surface facing up. But nobody's ever gonna see it. That's how it's gonna go on the wall. Okay, some people have asked how I'm gonna fit this to the wall itself, how it's gonna be anchored to the wall. And that's what this little plate does. So this is a 3D printed part. This hole, the big hole you can see here is where the wiring will come through from the wall. The terminal block will be connected to the mains wiring coming from the switch and the internal wiring of the light will come to that same terminal block. Now there are two M3 threaded holes inside that 3D printed part. It's just a bit of brass that's been inserted into a rectangular hole with the matching thread and that will take a pair of screws coming through from the outside of the frame. So if I put that together there you can sort of see how that's going to work. So there'll be a single M3 screw going through into that brass plate and that will get assembled right at the last minute. And on this one here, you can see it in place and you can see the M3 uh, round head screw on the outside there. That's also been plated. So it's fairly unobtrusive, but that's the, the best solution I could come up with uh, given that this is a very heavy assembly and that you've got to be able to you know, juggle it around and sort of get it in position and then try to hold it up on the wall in some way. Okay, here's one of the caps. That's a full assembly there. I'm really happy now that I actually made these parts separate and they were plated separately and held together with screws. I think it would have been really hard to get the plating to work down inside that joint there. And as it is, that just looked like a continuous single part, even though it's made of three separate items. The last step now is to fit all of these glass tubes and I'm not going to do that today, we'll do that in the next video and uh, the problem is going to be that I can't put the tubes in place with both of these caps on. So one will have to come off, I can insert all of the tubes into the other end and then somehow or other I've got to keep these aligned and then get the other cap on. Once that happens it's, it won't go anywhere. But uh, what I've done is I've designed and I'm making a 3D printed part which will help to align all of the tubing, keep it in place while I get the other cap on. Now it's all theoretical at this moment. I haven't tested it, but I'm confident it's gonna work. <laughs> so um, come back and watch me struggle with that. It should be a real laugh. Well, I'm gonna wrap up here now. Thank you very much for watching today. When we come back next time, I'm going to show you the map. Now, in the last round of comments, I got over three pages of new locations to go on the map. In fact, I had to go and buy a new packet of pins because it would run out. But you'll get to see that next time. We'll also see the wrap up of this project. And then I've got a number of other projects ready to start. In fact, one I've nearly finished, but I'm going to publish that when I get back from my holiday. Now, my wife and I are going overseas for four weeks. And uh, during that time, I'll try and publish one video and then I've got another one to come out very soon after that. So plenty of content still to come. But for now, it's Prezzo signing out. Thanks for watching today. Catch you next time. See ya.